be seated. And if you've got your Bibles, I'm going to ask you if you would to go to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3, we're going to look at one verse, really a part of one verse. Really the first part of 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. 1 Peter chapter 3. Verse 7, as we continue in our group of messages we started last week called Resolving Conflict in the Home, this morning we're going to talk about understanding your mate. Now, last week we talked about making peace with your past. And we really started this whole thing of this discussion of resolving conflict really with ourselves, starting with us. And that's really always the place you start. You start with yourself, and you make sure that those things that you bring into marriage or into that relationship are not part of the reason that you're having so much conflict. And so you evaluate yourself, you look at yourself, and, and whatever those ball and chains are that you bring into your marriage, you want to make sure that you've resolved them for you and that those things are dealt with. And a lot of times we don't even realize that we're working out of, in our marriage, the dysfunction that we've learned the way in terms of the way we were raised, in terms of the homes that we were brought up in. And so sometimes we can't really discern what's right and wrong because we don't necessarily either know enough of the Bible or know enough about God or whatever the case may be. And so we bring that dysfunction in and we try to operate in our present marriage relationship in and through what we've learned, what we have gleaned over the years in terms of what we grew up with. And so we talked about, first of all, if you really want to cut out some of the conflict in your home first, make peace with your own past. Deal with who uh, you are and uh, realize you are not who your past has made you, you are who God says you are. And that's a big, big, big deal. So this morning we're going to talk about now understanding your mate. And this goes to the heart of, of cutting conflict. And First Peter chapter 3, verse 7, here's what he says. He says, you husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way. Now, he goes on, as with someone weaker, since she's a woman, and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life so that your prayers will not be hindered. But I want to hone in on that little part in the front, you husbands, in the same way. Live with your wives in an understanding way. You know, a basic principle that is worth learning in life is this. Always be sure you know who you are dealing with. I heard about a fellow one time that phoned his local armory, spoke to one of the young recruits there. A fellow said, rather authoritatively he said son what kind of stops have we got there he said are we well stopped and the new recruit said yes sir we are he said we got six tanks six trucks 12 jeeps a whole lot of guns and ammunition and we got two big old cadillacs for our big fat general and the fellow that was causing uh, calling paused for just a minute and then he barked back he said private have you got any idea who you're talking to and private said no sir Fellow said, Private, this is General Weston. And then again, there was another long pause. And the private said to him, General Weston, do you have any idea who you're talking to? And a little bit surprised, General Weston said, No, sir. And then there was a little laugh. And as he was hanging up, he said, The private said, Well, then see you around, fatty. Yeah. Good good idea to always know who you're talking to or who you're dealing with whenever you're dealing with somebody else that you're not familiar with. Well, without a doubt, knowing who you're dealing with in life is important, and I don't know of any area in all of life where that truth is more important than it is in the home, particularly as it is in a marriage relationship. Knowing who you're dealing with goes a long way toward resolving a lot of the conflict that constantly cuts away at the seams of our married relationships. But now knowledge is not only part of it. Understanding is even better. Knowledge is information that if you're not careful, it'll lead to haughtiness. In other words, Paul said it puffeth you up. In other words, if if having all the facts in your head is all you want, then you'll get a little bit prideful and you'll get a little bit arrogant. And let me tell you, pride and arrogance doesn't go far in the home, in, in a relationship. And so it's not just about knowledge and having facts. Understanding is what you want to get to, and understanding is a behavior. And that behavior adjusts itself to the facts that you actually learn. So as you know something about someone or you know something or learn something about somebody, then 
then if you really understand, then you internalize that and you adjust accordingly. So while we need to know who we're dealing with, the goal is obviously not to just fill our heads with more information, but rather it is to understand. It's to allow that information that we know to be a guide for us so that it affects the way we behave and it directs the things that we do in dealing with our mates. And so that's really where we want to get to. Now, it's interesting. When you look at the life of Jesus, he was continuously concerning himself about the understanding that other people had of him. More than one time, Jesus asked his followers, here's what he said. He said, do you understand? Matthew chapter 13, he says, have you understood these things? On another occasion, John chapter 8, he said, why do you not understand what I'm saying? And over and over again, multiple times, he asked the questions, do you understand? In other words, it wasn't just a head full of facts that Jesus wanted folks to walk away with in their lives about him. What he wanted was for them to walk away having understood something about him. Understanding with a behavior that had taken the knowledge that they got, and then adjusted their lives according to the things that they learned as they interacted and dealt with him. So it's to be noted, knowledge and understanding are part of our relationship with Jesus. So, so that's what we have to know. And Jesus already knows all there is about us. He already understands all there is about us. And so that's why he came to this earth. That's why he died on the crimson hill called Calvary for us. It's because he does know us, he does understand us, he is aware of our plight, and so he acts accordingly. He adjusts himself accordingly to, to our need and so on. But part of our relationship with him is to be seeking to ever and always be knowing and learning more about him, trying to understand him better. Now, that's why we've got this book. That's why we've got the Bible. If you're going to understand more about God or you're going to more understand more about Jesus, you got to understand this book. you got to get in this book. you got to know him through this book. That's why he gave us the Holy Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, that one who's called the paraclete, who will come along beside of us, the comforter. He comes along to help us know more about Jesus. That's why he calls preachers and teachers and, 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 and uh, prophets and so on to come and lead and feed and care for us. He wants us to know more about him. He doesn't, just, he doesn't want us to just know more about him. He wants us to be able to understand him better, who he is, why he does what he does, and so on. So he wants us to understand. Now, why is it important that I emphasize that part of this thing of our relationship with Jesus? Well, it's because when you read the Bible, what you discover is that the Bible actually likens our relationship as a husband and wife to our relationship that we have with Jesus. It likens our relationship with Jesus to the marriage relationship that we have. And the Bible says our marriages ought to be patterned after. They ought to be built up on the same stuff that our relationship with Jesus is. And obviously, one of those things is knowledge, and the other is understanding. And I believe, really, Peter understood that point probably better than anybody in the Bible. Because, really, he's the only one in the New Testament, of all the New Testament writers, who challenged and crossed over the gender gap. And, and, and he was the only one that was so bold as to tell us that we ought to try to understand the one we live with, the one we call our husband or our wife. He said, you husbands, likewise, live with your wives, how? In an understanding way. Now, let me quickly go on to say here that I don't believe Peter forgot us fellas in that. I don't think he forgot to tell uh, you wives to live with your husbands in an understanding way or according to knowledge. I, I don't believe he forgot to include us here. I really believe he just knew that you ladies already do a pretty good job with that anyway based upon the way that God's built you and based upon the way that God's made you. But the principle I want you to know still stands true for all of us here whether he mentions you or not, the principle is true for all of us. If you really want to begin to cut down on the conflict in your home, if you really want to begin to chip away at the source of some of your greatest problems in your marriage and in your family, start by living with one another in an understanding way. 
Start by trying to understand, start by trying to process, start by trying to to get into the skin of the other and understand that person from their perspective, where they are. Now, there are at least three components, three key ingredients to building a good base of knowledge about something in general. And so they apply, tr- uh, truth of the matter is, to marriage as well. You've got to have research, you've got to have observation, and you've got to have listening involved. Now, all three of those together will help you build a good base of knowledge and understanding about your mate. Research, observation, and listening. So let's start with research. Let's start this thing about research. Maybe you thought, man alive, if I can ever get out of school, I'm not going to have to do any more research. I'm not going to have to write another paper. I'm not going to have to search out anything. I'm not going to have to uh, uh, read another book. I'm not going to have to do anything. No, that's wrong. Actually, when you get in your marriage, you ought to become the greatest student you've ever been. Sigmund Freud said on one occasion, he said, in all my research of 30 years or more, I still remain confounded by women. Well, truth is, Sigmund Freud was confounded, confounded by a lot of things. So it doesn't surprise me he was confounded by women. But it is true that research helps. <coughs> Excuse me. When you talk about reading and studying and research, I mean you should become the best student that you've ever been. It's one of the basic tools that's necessary in order to gain a better understanding of the way your husband or the way your wife thinks and feels and acts. In other words, applying yourself to the exercise of learning your mate. That's going to go a long way in helping you live with that guy or helping you live with that gal in an understanding way. Now, that shouldn't come as any great shock to you because what we're told in the Bible is, in our relationship with Jesus, the Bible tells us study to show thyself Approved. Isn't that right? That's the Bible. And that word study literally means to apply yourself to research, to apply yourself to advanced learning. You don't stay in the primary school of Christianity your whole life. You move on to middle school. You move on to high school. You move on to college. You try to grow in your understanding and your relationship, your knowledge of Jesus. And that's what we're to do in our knowledge and understanding of our husbands and our wives. We are to pursue knowledge. We're to pursue a Ph.D. in our wives, fellas. And ladies, you're to pursue a Ph.D. in those guys. You're to be like one lady said. She said, I got an earned doctorate. Somebody said, in what? She said, in that louse around my house. You're to know each other. You're to have an understanding about each other, the kind of understanding that's going to make your behavior better toward them when they do what they do or they say what they say or they act the way they do, you're going to understand them better. Now, what's a good place to start learning about your mate? How do you start really learning something about your mate? Well, let me tell you where you can start. The Bible. You can start in the Word of God. The Bible's not a science book. It's not a biology book. It's not a psychology book. But I want to tell you, you can understand enough about your husband or about your wife if you just open the Word of God and start reading things about them. And what the Bible tells us is natural and part of the natural inclinations of a man or a woman in the Bible. I can tell you another place. Good, godly Christian books by Christian authors. And if you've got a problem with good, godly Christian books by Christian authors, then you've got a problem with Paul. And I'll tell you why. Because Paul used books, godly Christian books, all the time. In fact, at one occasion, he told Timothy when he was in prison in Rome, he said, look, come to me and bring my books, bring my parchments to me, because he wanted to read. So, so it's helpful to begin to learn how and who that person is, how God's made her, how God's made him. Read books like this, His Needs, Her Needs. By Willard Harley. Good book. You'll learn something right there about that other one if you start reading a book like that, His Needs, Her Needs. You can read something like The Art of Understanding Your Mate by a guy named Cecil Osborne. It's a good book. And you can learn something about each other in there. Men and Marriage, Rocking the Rolls by Howard Hendricks. You can read something like Men Are Clams and Women Are Crowbars like David Clark wrote. What I've come to learn about a lot of us is it's not that we're unwilling to meet our husbands or our wives' needs. It's just that we don't know what their needs are. 
we come into our marriages, we come into our relationships many times very, very unschooled and unlearned. And all we know is what we've been predispositioned for through the dysfunction of our own homes we grew up in. And that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to make it for your marriage or your relationship. You ladies don't know how we fellas think and see things and do things. Now, you think you do, but you don't. And we fellas don't know how you ladies think and see things and look at things. We think you, we do, but we don't. So we just all think that whatever's important to us must be important to you as a husband or a wife. The only problem with that is that just ain't true because that's not the case. Now, let me give you an example so that you can get a picture of this, what this looks like. An example is many, many years ago, one of the things for us used to be, you know, spending time together. So I don't know how many of you husbands, wives ever had that issue, you know, how much time. Now, you may get older, and the older you get, you may get that. But let me tell you, when you're first, those years when your kids are small, for instance, in our case, we, we lived in various areas because I was pastoring a church, his wife was a teacher and so on. And so I didn't live anywhere close to my family, so we had, and nor hers. So we had no mamas, no daddies, no brothers, no sisters, no aunts, no uncles, no anybody around who could care for our children. And Eleanor was not necessarily comfortable just leaving them with anybody. Man, I'd have left them with anybody and the brother came by. I mean, hey, you want some kids? All right, well, here's mine. Not Eleanor. And so, so it was one of those kind of things wherever we were. If we were in Alabama or we were on the other side of uh, Paul and Canada, wherever we were, it was one of those things where it was just us. And, you know, when you got kids growing up along the way, you got to do something with them. You can't just leave them. And so it was one of those kind of things where, you know, we had to take them with us. So we never, ever had time just by ourselves, to ourselves. And you need that, couples. You need that. And so we didn't have it. And so so, uh, so she was frequently talking about, well, you know, I just wish we could be together, just have time alone, those kind of things. Well, being the romantic guy that I am, and, of course, you guys know how romantic I am. Um, I, I made a suggestion that I thought would be really, really good. I suggested that since they were just a little bit older and it was a very, you know, some smaller area and we could feel comfortable, cl- grocery store wasn't too far away. I said, why, when you go get groceries, why don't I just go with you? Okay, that didn't go over too well. Because, and I've offered this many times. And for some reason, I, my wife didn't understand the romance of me going to the grocery store with her. For the life of me, I can't understand why she doesn't understand that. And so she would say things like this. Here's the kind of stuff she'd say. Uh, you want me to go? No. Well, you, you uh, and then she wouldn't show any interest in me going. Or she'd say something like, you know, I'll just go by myself. Or I'd rather just go by myself. <gasps> you'd rather go by yourself than with, without me? I, I mean, than with me? And so it was one of those kind of things where, now here's what could happen. Initially, many, 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 many years ago, and this was back in the days of the dinosaurs when we were just really young and, you know, with the kids, it, it, it hurt. Why doesn't my wife want to be romantic and go to the grocery store with me? And then after I got to learning her a little bit and understanding and realizing, seeing things from her way and understanding that if she goes with me, number one, she's going to spend $50 more than if she goes by herself. Settle down. I didn't ask for amens at that point. And number two, if she goes with me, it's going to take her a whole lot longer because I'm going to drag around doing something else or looking at something else that she has no interest in. And so after I started seeing things from her perspective and realizing she had no interest in going to the grocery store with me, because why was she going to get groceries? She's getting groceries because we need groceries. And so the more I tried to understand it from her perspective. Now, from again, from my perspective, she wasn't saying she didn't love me. She's not saying she didn't love the kids or want to be with us. She's not saying that grocery shopping, I mean, she's just, she's just saying that grocery shopping, in her eyes, just ain't what it is in mine. In my male, romanceless mind, we're in the same building, we're doing the same thing, we're doing it at the same time with the same person, we are buddy pals. Wow, that's romantic. And we're together. 
But in her mind, that's all it is. We're in the same building, doing the same thing, doing it at the same time with the same old people, but there ain't not one thing particular stimulating or motivating about the fact that we are in the same place being together. Listen, she's getting groceries for goodness sakes. We're not tromping through the wildflowers together. And so it's one of those kind of things where now I could have just let that, but over time I've come to understand that that in my mind's not the same thing that she has in her mind, and it doesn't make, it doesn't ever meet. And, and I, I, the more I read, the more I studied, the more I looked at good godly books to tell me how, what kind of needs she actually has and, and how those motivate and drive her, the more I realized that that's not what she's saying when she says, let's be together. And I learned that in a good godly book by Willard Harley, Disney Eternity. And when you learn these kind of things, you don't get nearly as angry, you don't get nearly as hurt when you find out they're just acting and thinking and doing things the way that God made them. They're not trying to knock you. They're not trying to hurt you. They're operating out of the way that they've been built by God. Now listen, and that's not necessarily wrong. It's just different from you. God made you one way with a different set of personalities and proclivities, and he made me as a man different personalities and proclivities and so on. And that's the way. It's not wrong. It's that he made us different for a purpose. It's like the thing I learned years ago about we men's brain and you women's brain. Most of you have heard this. Now, in the male brain, the left and right hemispheres typically run independently of one another. That is, we emphasize one side of the brain over the other side of the brain. That's why, that's why we're so doggone zoned in to whatever it is we're doing a lot of times, whatever it may be. We're literally, you, you think you've said this in jest, but we're literally brain dead in one side or the other. We shut down on one side, and we shut out all the other distractions. Now, on the other hand, you ladies' brains operate in a lot more integrative, holistic way, more like a high-speed computer. So you can have 15 different things going on at one time, and you can still be giving all 15 things full attention. You know why? Because you're not brain dead like we are. But you see, if you don't know these things, if you don't know this, we fellows will get hurt and we'll get upset because we think you're not paying us any mind. You're caring about the kids more. You care about the laundry more. You care about making the bed. You care about all this stuff in the house. You care about that and you don't care about me. Wine, wine, wine. Give me some time. And if you ladies get upset and you'll get hurt, Because you think we're not interested, and we're not concerned, and we don't have any interest in you. No, we're just dead on one side. So you got to learn some things about men. you got to learn some things about women and about how God made us. So you got to do some research. you got to do some investigation. you got to learn. That's what the Bible says. That's what Peter said. Live with your wives or with your husband in an understanding way. Now, second thing, that's research, investigation. Second thing, observation. Benjamin Franklin once said of marriage, he said that the wise person is he who keeps his eyes wide open before marriage and half shut during it. Now, he was talking about the need that exists for forbearance and forgiveness. That's what he was talking about. Once you get married, he was talking about the importance of of overlooking some things and forgiving and so on. And there's a need for a lot of that. But there is a sense in which every one of us ought to go into our marriage with our eyes wide open, and we ought to go through it with our eyes wide open as well. In Matthew chapter 9, some of the disciples of John the Baptist come to Jesus. They ask him why his disciples weren't fasting like them and the Pharisees and so on. And here's what Jesus said. He said, the attendants of the bridegroom can't mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them, can they? Now, the attendants in those days were the ones who waited and watched for the bridegroom to make his way toward the bride as he was moving from his house to hers. 
And whenever that bridegroom started to make his move from his house to her house, those attendants would go running out, sort of like the Paul Revere's. And they'd start running out saying, the bridegroom is coming, the bridegroom is coming, the bridegroom is coming. And what Jesus was saying here was that as long as he was with his attendants, it would be completely ridiculous for them to act like he wasn't there because the attendants' actions were based on what the bridegroom was doing. What Jesus was saying was, look, as long as they're with me, they're going to act that way. They're going to keep their eyes on me. They're going to watch every move I make. And that's the way, that's what you and I ought to be doing in our relationship with Jesus. That's what we ought to be doing in our relationship with our husbands and wives. As long as we're with each other, we ought to be soaking up all that we can learn about one another. Watching each other. Observing each other. Learning about the patterns and the propensities and the proclivities and the personalities of each other. Learning that. Jesus told his followers on one occasion, he said, take this yoke upon you and learn of me. He's saying, learn the way I work. Learn the way I walk and talk and do things. Watch my ways. Know how I operate. Become sensitive to everything about me. And that's what Peter's telling us to do in our marriages. He's saying we ought to apply ourselves to becoming a student of our husband or our wives. We ought to learn and research and study how God has made us as men and women, how we think, how we act, what the needs of our husband and wife is. And we ought to observe each other from the standpoint of watching with interest, measured interest to learn their patterns and their proclivities and their personalities. Book of Proverbs says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. Now listen to that again. Train up a child in the way he should go. You know what that means? That phrase, train up a child in the way, literally means according to the natural bent or the natural inclinations of that child's life according to the way that they have been made by God. You ever ask yourself how you're supposed to know that? How do you know how to train or to raise your child up according to the natural bent, the way that God's made them? How do you know that? How are you supposed to get in on that? You know how it is? Observation. Watch them. Watch them as they grow, as they grow, as they get older and older. older. Watch them. Observe them. Learn to become, let, let them become a laboratory. And so all of a sudden, if you watch them, they begin to tell you by their, their, their passions, their loves, their interests, the things and the ways that God has made them. And then you begin to support that and you buttress that and you push them and you move them. You help them see that and recognize that so that they'll become the way that God has made them. I remember years ago, we were at the zoo. We were watching the elephant exercises. One of the zoo directors was standing there with looked like somebody that she was training to take her position. And so her comments, I thought, man, they're, they're fitting. And the reason is because as she started explaining and talking about their philosophy there at the zoo and so on, here's what she said. She said, look, she said, this isn't Disney World. She said, this isn't Six Flags. She said, we're not here to provide entertainment. She said, this is a place to learn about the animals that we house. And I thought to myself, man, what a sobering thought. The zoo's not to be a place for entertainment. The zoo is a place to learn. And that's what our marriages are. They're a place to learn about all the animals that live there. It's a place to learn. Learn the ways and the particular propensities of your husband and your wife. Watch the way that God has made them. Is your husband the kind of fellow that needs to cut the grass once a week to feel good about himself? I mean, is that the kind of guy you got? I mean, is he the kind of guy who's going to grunt and burp for at least the first hour and a half when he gets home from work every day? Hey, that ought to tell you a little something. That, that tells you a little bit something about him. Now you know a little bit more. What about your wife, guys? I mean, is your wife, is her conversation each day the size of a global conference? I, I mean, does, does she fall in bed at night and fall asleep the second that she lays her head down? That I'll tell you a little something. When, when do they tend to get upset the most or, or most discouraged? When are they up or when are they down? Or what hurts them? 
what hurts them, what, what's hard for them to handle. What, what, what do they like? What do they not like? What is it that really drives them and motivates them? Look, that's when, that's when you're learning them, when you understand those things, the things that, that uh, are hard for them. You, you, you're beginning to get sensitive to what their needs are and what drives them and what their issues are. And you do that through observing. You do that through observation. Third thing, if you're going to cut down on this thing of conflict, and you're going to live with your mate in an understanding way. You've got to research, investigate, learn something about them. You've got to observe them, watch them. See the things that hurt them and the things that drive them, the things that make them happy. Be sensitive to those things. And finally, listen. Listen to them. In the book of Revelation, Jesus addresses seven churches of Asia Minor. And he writes to them to correct some errors that's going on in the churches. And at the conclusion of each of those addresses, Jesus issues this stern warning. Here's what he says. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who has an ear, let him hear. Now, you know it's possible to listen to something without ever really hearing anything. But time and time again in his earthly ministry, when Jesus really wanted somebody to understand something, and he really wanted them to get the gravity of what he was saying, and he emphasized it. Here's what he'd say. He said, he who has an ear, let him hear. What he was saying is, you better not miss this. You better get what I'm telling you. This is important. So just like we're to listen with radar-like intensity to Jesus, we're to listen like that in our marriages. We're to listen with the goal of hearing. We're to listen with the goal of understanding. Not just because we know it's going to be our turn to talk next. That's a big difference. Edgar, Edgar Watson Howe used to say, most folks wouldn't listen to you talk if they, if they didn't know that it was going to be their turn to talk next. We're to listen. But not because it's going to be our turn to talk next. We're to listen to hear the heart. And that's important. You've got to hear somebody's heart. Not just the words that they're saying. You've got to hear the meaning of those words. Herb Cohen says, because remember, meanings aren't in words. The meanings are in people. And that's important. And people speak. And sometimes don't speak, but express themselves in the way they act with the needs and de desires of their heart. And so there's a lot of talk in our society. But there's very little hearing. We use a lot of big words in our society, but we say very little when we talk. And what Jesus seems to be saying to us is, look, I gave you two ears and I gave you one mouth. And I gave it to you for a reason that way. So you can listen more, and you can talk less. But the problem is we listen to defend our turf. And that's what happens in marriage. And that's why conflict rises up so quickly in our marriages. Because we listen to defend our territory and come at it from our perspective. And to, uh, to push and to promote our own agendas. When in reality, we're to be listening to try to understand. And Jesus says we're to hear the heart. We're to hear the real need, not a position that's being presented. What is the need? What is the fear? What is the hurt or the concern that your husband or your wife is trying to communicate when they make those statements that sound like they want to fight? Guys, when she starts in on you and says something like, well, you never spend any time with me. She uses an absolute. You never. Have you ever in the last 25 years not spent any time with her whatsoever? Now, see, she's using an absolute right there. But, and that's almost like a fight. So what a lot of guys want to do is they want to come back and they want to fight to defend their territory. Well, you know when I go to get groceries, I spend time with you. You know when I take the trash and I spend time with you. No, you're just defending your territory now. No, if you don't want conflict in the home, ask yourself, what is she saying? 
She's telling you the outcome. She's telling you what she's feeling and the symptom. But ask yourself, what is the real need? What is the concern? What is the hurt? What she may be saying to you is way deeper than you never spend time. What she's telling you is she needs you. Ladies, when he starts in on you, he says, well, you're always complaining about me being gone. You're always griping about this. or You know, you're like a steady drip. You're always criticizing me about this or, or that or whatever. Don't start defending yourself. Don't start fighting. He's not asking for a fight. What's the need? What's he really telling you? What's the hurt? And what he may be saying to you is, why don't you support me in this? I'm trying to provide. I really am, and what a man needs is support. He needs to know you're with him, that you're in his camp, that you're there to help. Don't listen for the words. Listen for the meaning. Because the meaning is not necessarily in the words. The meaning is in the person. Listen. 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 Understand your mate. If you want to cut down on the conflict in the home, start listening more and talking less. Listen to the person, not just the words. So you want to cut down on the conflict in your home? Here you go. Understand them. Understand each other. Do some research, some investigation. Hey, pick up a book from time to time and try to understand how God's built your wife or your husband. Observe them, watch them, be sensitive, look closely. Let them be a learning laboratory for you and watch them and listen to them. Not just listening to the words. Listen to the heart and what they're saying maybe by even their argumentative tone. So I got a question. And here's the question. How well do you really, really Know your husband, ladies. How well do you really, really know your wife, guys? How much time have you invested in learning and understanding them? When was the last time you sat down with each other and you spent some time together just trying to understand? In the end, the ability and desire to understand each other, now hear me carefully, is a choice. Now, this just gets in your business. It's a choice. I know that some people are born with greater skills and greater insight than others. That enables them to understand how folks think and how folks feel. But I want to tell you, even if you're not an instinctive and naturally insightful people person, God is going to give you the ability and the means to understand the one you're married to. But let me tell you, you got to choose to do it. you got to apply yourself. you got to stop being so self-centered and defending your own territory, thinking about you first. And you got to try to understand where they're coming from. And it may be radically different from what you've ever seen or heard. Remember, Many people may be coming from their own dysfunctional past, and that's all they know. And you may have to try to help them see that the things they're trying to live out now are from a very dysfunctional predisposition that they might have to address or look at. But you can't come at that, and if they, if they, if they don't know any better than that, then that's what they come with. And you married that, you chose that, that was a choice. Since you chose that, you better choose to try to understand and find a way to work through and try to understand and help and bring healing so that your marriage becomes all God wanted it to be. Can I remind you of this? I've told you nothing today that's contrary to what Jesus has done for us. The same thing Jesus did with us. Rather than thinking about himself, and his own personal desires. Jesus understood us enough. That he gave his own life sacrificially. To pay the price for our sin. He knew our dysfunctional past enough. 
to even say, you know what, in spite of that, I'm going to love you in the midst of it. That's what Jesus did for us. He understood you and me enough, and he gave himself in spite of us. That's what it takes to make marriage. Cut down on the conflict. Don't let your home be a war zone and a hot house. Make it a home that honors God and pleases him. Let's stand for prayer. No one looking around. Every eye closed. Every eye closed. Father God, you know, you know every one of us in this house better than we know ourselves. And God, you know that there's not one single one of us in this place that's ever been married that's ever, that's ever been perfect in the process. There's not one of us that know the perfect answers and that have lived it perfectly. God, it is my prayer today that you'd help us all, no matter how long we've been married or how short we've been married, that you'd help us all to be, to be better at making our homes what you've called them to be, of removing the conflict. God, that's not your desire. You don't... You don't want us having to come home every day of life always yelling and screaming and hooting and hollering and upset about something that the other's always done wrong. God, help us. Help us to care enough to choose to understand, to live with our mates in an understanding way according to knowledge. Just as you've done with us, sacrificially, in giving your own life for us, understanding and knowing us well enough to know that we didn't deserve it, we didn't warrant it, we didn't earn it, but you gave it as an act of grace. Help us, God, to choose to do that with our mates, just as you did it with us. We pray in Christ's name.